additional planned maintenance this week. However, they have lost some additional supply due to unplanned factors. So again, this is contributing to, you know, either the static no movement or decrease in the energy availability factor. This is just in terms of the week ahead. I think, again, if we look at the week of the uh, 22nd of May, the coming week, and if you look at the columns on the far right, if you look at the planned uh, risk levels and you look at the uh, the likely risk levels, you can see in both cases, we expect it to be a red week ahead, which really means that we should expect to be in low shedding, and the extent of that low shedding is likely to be between four and six, stages four and six for the coming week. Now, I touched earlier on the fact that they had uh, this morning done the quarterly briefing, and I think what's important to note from the quarterly briefing is that if Eskim is able to maintain the unplanned loss factor at about 15,000 megawatts, if it keeps it to 15,000 and below, then we will be in stage six or below. If that unplanned factor jumps above 15,000, closer to the 18,000 megawatt uh, unavailability, then the stages of load shedding, in my view, will certainly increase, and the chances of us getting to a stage seven and eight would be very likely if they cannot keep the unplanned loss factor below 15,000 megawatts. If I look at the performance over the last uh, month, April, and I look at the performance to date in terms of plant, I think it's highly likely that there is a risk that in the winter we will find ourselves in deeper stages of load shedding, uh, just given the fact the, the availability factor hasn't improved significantly. So I think in summary, energy availability uh, for this week, uh, it's been at 52.3%. Uh, the best ever recorded in this uh, year was in week 11, which was 58%. Uh, there was a slight peak, uh, you know, in week 16, where we jumped to about 53, but that's gone down again. And if I look at the comparison between this year and last year, uh, currently, the average EAF is around 52.5%, and last year it was sitting at 58%. Uh, I think also important to note is when you look at the outlook for the year, uh, we're definitely going to be in stage two and above, and I think we can probably say with some comfort, stage four and above, and that the expected uh, relief is only likely to come in 2024. And if you look at the earliest indication of where Eskom will possibly meet the reserve, it's going to be in about March 2024. So I think we're in for, 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 for quite a difficult time ahead. And I think uh, as the citizens of the province and the country, and again, as provincial government, our job is to inform you about what's happening and for us to then start to prepare on how to manage around these scenarios. But thank you very much, Regan. I hope this uh, gives people more insight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lester. Definitely sobering, but we need to be honest and we need this insight from the experts. Um, I'll now hand over to the Premier. Very good afternoon to you, Premier. Good afternoon, and uh, I apologize for not uh, logging on as this uh, Digicon started. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to Mr. Alvi Lester for getting it going. Uh, as you can see behind me, I'm at the at the uh, International Convention Center, and I was unfortunately on stage as a judge for a competition for schools, both in the Northern Cape, the Eastern Cape, and the Western Cape. And these were uh, this was a competition for uh, youth on uh, looking for alternative energy solutions for communities, towns, schools, etc. And it really was amazing to see the kind of innovations coming up from uh, the youth. And uh, that for me is very exciting because it bodes well for our, uh, our future. Uh, of course, uh, Inlet Africa, also a very important platform for business to business. And you'll see behind me, there are country stands uh, from around the world. There are businesses from around the world. And there are, of course, local South African uh, businesses as well, all focused on energy solutions. So it's perfect uh, for a Digicon and perfect for the crisis that we find ourselves in. I've only got one other message, and that is uh, as a government, uh, uh, we've, we've uh, you know, we'll continue to push forward on our plan, making sure that we are focusing on specifically the, the crux of, of the problem. So the plan is to get ourselves out of 
uh, load shedding in the Western Cape over time, but at the same time making sure that we're focusing on enough uh, backup generation for our water systems and our sewage systems at local government level, uh, at provincial level, our clinics and our hospitals. We've got those backup plans in our schools to make sure that the basic services continue. Our municipalities putting battery backup systems just in traffic lights, which makes a big difference during a load shedding period. And many of these interventions, but of course, at the end of the day, it's also about the big interventions, about enabling our municipalities, enabling the private sector to come in with solutions over time. And then uh, those uh, next two big projects for us are obviously the emergency packs, which I've spoken about before, uh, and the first few small towns that we're going to try and get load shedding free this year, both of those two issues are at the Energy Council on Monday, and uh, that will take us to the next step of uh, starting to put those two projects specifically into, into reality. But uh, thank you once again, and uh, it's uh, great that you've all joined us on this platform today, and uh, I'm happy to hand back uh, to you. Uh, again. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Um, it's now that time of the Digicon where we hand over, we hand the microphone and the um, the camera to our special guest for this week. It's of course none other than Western Cape uh, Minister for Finance and Economic Opportunities and her team. Over to you, Minister. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Regan. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to join you on this edition of the Digicon and to be able to discuss our plans to increase energy resilience in the Western Cape and also importantly to locate uh, this within our new economic strategy, the Growth for Jobs strategy. So let me share my screen. There we go. hope it's visible. All right. So concretely, uh, the recently completed Growth for Jobs strategy envis envisages a trillion rand jobs, rich, inclusive, sustainable and resilient provincial economy that's growing between four and six percent per year in real terms by 2035. The fact is, if we don't get the foundations for growth right, uh, we won't be able to achieve higher growth rates and breakout economic growth to be able to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. And so at the heart of this plan is the understanding that it's the private sector that creates jobs and it's government's role to enable the private sector sector's success by getting the fundamentals of growth right. So we're focusing essentially on the economic building blocks or the factors of production. Um, to ensure that we realize this full potential of our economy to grow and to create jobs, we've set out seven focus areas which include uh, driving growth opportunities through investment, stimulating domestic markets and exports, which include tourism, energy resilience and transition to net zero carbon, which is what we're focusing on today, water security and resilience, technology and innovation, infrastructure and the connected economy, and finally, improved access to economic opportunities. And this, of course, includes skills, entrepreneurship and employability. Um, so we know that load shedding has reached unprecedented levels, and this, of course, compromises economic growth and job creation at precisely the time where we need it the most to pull people out of poverty. And we can't hope to grow the economy uh, or create jobs or attract investment unless we have a stable and adequate energy supply. So to do this, we've allocated 1.1 billion rand over the next three years to reduce the impact of load shedding. And through our growth for job strategy, we aim to between 1,800 and 5,700 megawatts by 2035. We anticipate this will attract between 21 and 68 billion rand in related investment. So um, right now, we know that electricity is the number one um, binding constraint to economic growth and job creation. Nationally, the impact of escalating load shedding has led to an estimated 1 million fewer jobs. In the Western Cape, load shedding is estimated to have cost our economy more than 8 billion rand in GDP last year. But we also know that the Western Cape has tremendous potential for renewable energy. Um, we also understand that the ESCOM transmission network constraints prevent a rapid utility scale investment and also that uh, a just energy transition is critical for future investment and also for regional competitiveness. Um, 
So I'd li now like to hand over to Helen Davies, who's the Chief Director of the Green Economy in the Western Cape's Department of Economic Development and Tourism. And she'll talk us through a little bit of the excellent work that has been done so far. Some of it may seem a bit technical, but the fact is that we have to get our wheeling frameworks, which is how to move power from one part of the grid to another, and our cost of supply studies and electricity master plans in place, as these really are the basis for bringing more energy onto the grid. So we're working to create a coherent and predictable policy environment in our province, and we're helping municipalities to do research to understand and to quantify their electricity needs now and into the future. So basically what we're doing is our homework to be prepared and to plan for new sources of energy in a responsible way. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Helen. Welcome. Thank you very much, Minister, and afternoon to everyone on the call. Um, so jumping straight into things, just get this presentation up. So I'm going to be speaking to a little bit more detail in terms of the Western Cape's Energy Resilience Program. Uh, to start off with, it's to give context as to what are the key factors that we need to balance uh, when we run such a program or plan for such a program. So on the private sector side, their energy focus is really around, given the current status, is businesses wanting to and needing to implement their own energy systems, but also uh, to really focus and see what they can do uh, to improve energy resilience in the country generally. Um, and that's because businesses recognize they're part of a broader economy, but they also have suppliers and customers that are in the broader economy. Um, and so really have that interest in supporting energy resilience across the country. And then thirdly, we have energy developers who are the providers of these alternative energy systems um, and services. On the municipal side, um, they're experiencing uh, incredible load shedding impacts, um, both on businesses, households and municipal operations. Um, so just the same that we all subject to various stages of load shedding, municipalities that need to run core functions such as wastewater treatment, um, the provision of water to households and businesses, etc., are impacted by load shedding. Uh, secondly, because everyone's using less um, energy due to load shedding, uh, municipalities lose a, um, a source of their income, and that subsequently impacts on the services that they can provide. Thirdly, uh, municipalities are approached by increasing numbers of energy developers who are wanting to support part of the solution, um, but we potentially get into a space of unsolicited bids. Um, which is something the, that uh, municipalities need to be cautious of. And then lastly, the municipality faces uh, in, uh, increasing costs to help manage their services during times of load shedding. Um, so a lot of them, for example, have installed diesel generators, burning diesel and looking at alternative energy systems to keep their operations going. So given all this, our provincial approach to energy resilience really has to balance all of these aspects. Um, we've got to look at how we reduce the impacts of load shedding, but also how we enable sustainable service delivery, serve citizens and still enable the economy to grow. So the key strategic uh, objectives of the program have been covered uh, by both Alvi and Minister um, in terms of reducing the impacts of load shedding uh, on citizens and businesses, but also to uh, facilitate a lower level reliance on ESCOM. We recognize that a program of the scale requires a whole of government approach, and it also requires a whole of society and the private sector approach. Uh, this is very much a partnership. Um, and we need to so solve uh, things together. There are five key programs um, within the broader energy resilience program, uh, which Alvi has laid out in his overview. To speak to slightly more detail in terms of the load shedding relief program, this speaks to some of the projects that the Premier alluded to just now in terms of uh, emergency load shedding packs uh, to indigent and other lower income households, um, but also to services uh, to businesses. Uh, to SMMEs around uh, reducing the impact of load shedding, um, but also being able to provide an alternative energy source for those businesses. Um, and thirdly, the program which is looking, the project which is looking at uh, pilot renewable energy and battery systems uh, to a number, a small number of towns in the Western Cape uh, to try to reduce the impact of load shedding on those towns and to assess how those financial models work. 
we recognize that we really need um, a strategic approach to what technologies we bring on play, uh, bring on stream um, and the timing of different uh, energy solutions to addressing the Western Cape Energy Resilience Program. That then informs uh, what we call demand side management program, which is essentially around uh, how do we uh, improve our energy efficiency and how do we reduce our peak loads at certain points um, so that we can both reduce costs, uh, but also right size alternative energy systems that we put in place. So we're only investing in uh, the size system we need and we're not over investing but also to use this what, um, in terms of negotiations with national government around potential buffering from load shedding. The new energy generation program is really around how we enable new energy onto the grid, whether that be uh, public sector uh, energy. So we have a program that focuses on municipal procurement from independent power producers, but also how we enable private sector um, to generate new energy, um, which I'll go into further detail on just now, and how do we enable households to become part of the system. And then the network development program, which is really around having an infrastructure, the infrastructure, grid infrastructure, that enables the movement of energy that's generated from where it's generated to where it's needed. And all of that uh, needs to be underlain by uh, investment. So how do we access alternative finance, alternative funding? What kind of financing mechanisms do we put in place to really incentivize different forms of energy? So as the minister said, we have a budget, assigned a budget of 1.1 billion over the next three years, but that's also complemented uh, by the investments in energy of the city of Cape Town and other Western Cape municipalities. We certainly haven't started from scratch. There's a lot of work uh, that's taken place within the Western Cape. Um, firstly, in terms of the REAP, this is the National Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program, where we continue to provide what support might be needed uh, for utility scale companies uh, to apply for and be successful in the REAP program. Um, secondly, municipal IPP procurement, where we've been supporting five municipalities um, around IPP procurement, uh, with more detailed support being provided to Stellenbosch municipality for an up to 50 megawatt um, project. The city of Cape Town is moving great guns, uh, their 200 megawatt tender, which is nearing completion. And they have also recently issued a dispatchable tender for a further 500 megawatts. We've also been exploring uh, pooled buying where we're looking at multiple municipalities being able to buy energy from multiple um, uh, energy generators. So it's really trying to look at a lower risk and therefore a lower cost solution for municipalities. In the wheeling space, um, essentially there, there's been support to a number of large private sector wheeling projects in the Western Cape, which will hopefully reach, reach fruition soon. And we could see another 470 megawatts added through these projects. Uh, we'll speak just now to the support that's been given to municipalities around wheeling frameworks and tariffs, um, as well as to the wheeling use of systems agreements uh, that we have developed. In terms of SSEG, um, so this is small scale embedded generation, essentially rooftop PV or rooftop solar panels. 24 of the 25 Western Cape munis local municipalities uh, have SSEG frameworks in place and 21 of those enable a feed-in tariff. And this has resulted in 197 megawatts of registered SSEG capacity in the Western Cape. Just like to point out that this doesn't include the recent spike that we know has taken place in registrations uh, in the first quarter of this year. Um, and we continue so to support a number of businesses. So both those who are wanting to implement uh, alternative energy solutions, but also those that are providing those solutions, whether they be services or technologies. Um, we have final stages of what is called the Western Cape MER, the Municipal Energy Resilience Fund. And through this fund, um, we provided municipalities with funding for uh, what we call foundational energy studies. And these really enable both municipal and private sector energy projects. So the first of these is a cost of supply studies. Um, and these are really critical so that municipalities can set cost reflective tariffs. Um, so if they are going to pay back uh, money for energy fed into the grid, if they are going to enable the municipal grid to be used for the purposes of wheeling, um, to use as that connection, et cetera, they need to know the correct tariffs that enable them to incentivize these new systems 
but also maintain the um, financial sustainability of the municipalities. Cost of supply studies, however, are quite tricky um, because there are unknowns around ESCOM pricing and also around uh, consumption patterns um, and the extent to which those will be influenced by further load shedding and the cost of electricity. Uh, secondly, uh, electricity master plans are critical for municipalities to understand where they have spare capacity on their grids, um, but also the state of those grids. And that helps us to understand where grids might need to be strengthened, but also where we can relatively easily connect private sector projects onto grids, um, so where there is capacity available. Uh, the chart provided on the right hand side just indicates the recent work that's taking place or has taken place around cost of supply studies uh, and EMPs. So to focus on the private sector support work, um, the second block from the top is a piece of work that's recently being completed where we have been engaging with um, 150 sites across the Western Cape. These are private sector high energy users. Uh, the top 20 in the city and five in the other municipalities. And that's really with a view to understanding what their current energy use is, but also what their projected energy uh, demands will be uh, and where they're looking to put uh, alternative energy systems in place. Essentially, what we found is that uh, businesses on, on the whole are really putting in alternative systems, but for now, a lot of that has been focused on diesel generation. But the cost of that is fast becoming unsustainable. Um, through that, we've also identified that a number of businesses are actively looking and needing to look at reducing their carbon footprint, whether that be because they're part of a multinational company that is putting increasingly stringent criteria in place, or they're part of one of those companies' uh, supply chains, or that they recognize the, um, the fast onslaught of carbon border adjustment mechanisms um, that are in place for a lot of our export uh, businesses. But essentially, we're trying to understand the demand side uh, for businesses in the Western Cape. In terms of wheeling, uh, there we have uh, supported seven municipalities and the city has their own uh, municipal wheeling framework um, and draft tariffs. Um, so that's basically the tariff that they would charge for a developer and an off taker to use their grid. ESCOM also enables wheeling through their grid, um, but at the moment we are focusing here on the municipal grids. To further support wheeling, what is needed and was called for by industry is what's called use of systems agreements. Um, so these vary widely, um, even within a municipality and then between municipalities. Uh, so we have just completed the development of a standardized set of use of systems agreements. This enables municipalities to enter into contracts with energy developers and off-takers more easily and also reduce the cost of that. But it also helps businesses who have footprints across multiple municipalities um, to start uh, being able to have consistency in the agreements uh, and the costs that are set. Excuse me. Um, we also um, have just finished uh, the development of a municipal wheeling revenue impact assessment model. Um, and this is to help inform municipalities around their decisions around uh, wheeling. So it basically enables municipalities to understand what those impacts might be, how they can minimize those impacts, um, and through that uh, to give support to further wheeling projects. And then the support around uh, solar panels, solar PV continues in the Western Cape. And all of this is, an, is aimed at helping municipalities to use their wires business, as it were, in a slightly different way, uh, but also to maximize op opportunities uh, for new energy systems. We recognize there's a lot of work still to take place in terms of wheeling. So ESCOM has been uh, exploring a virtual wheeling model. While that provides uh, could provide ease in terms of the administration around wheeling processes, it's not clear as to the timing of that model. And so we certainly encourage municipalities to continue with individual wheeling agreements uh, until such time as the virtual wheeling uh, platform becomes clearer and in place. Municipalities, we're encouraging also to be clear with the private sector and others around what their intentions are. Um, so publishing their wheeling frameworks, uh, sharing use of systems agreements, um, but also updating the cost of supply studies and administrative work that's needed to enable wheeling. 
There is work taking place at a national level uh, around wheeling frameworks, um, and we certainly feed the work that we're developing in the Western Cape into those national processes to help the development of wheeling in the country as a whole. And then lastly, it's for municipalities um, to be able to share with the private sector and others as to where they do have space uh, within their networks to be able to connect in new energy projects. And this is the last slide from our side is we are inundated uh, with business queries, uh, but also offers of support. And then businesses wanting to put forward their services um, or their products as part of the solutions to the energy crisis. Um, we do have what we call a, um, a business query funnel. The web address is here. We really encourage you um, to submit any queries through that linkage. Um, for some queries, it's fairly basic information that we're asking for up front. Um, but if, for example, it's a business that has a technology or a service to offer, we ask for a different level of detail, and that's to really help us to prioritize queries, to manage queries, and to allocate those in the best way possible. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen, much appreciated. And of course, thank you, Minister. Um, I'm now going to open the floor to questions. And it's very clear that some of those who've joined this edition of the Digicon, they've wasted no time in sending through um, their questions. I note a few have already come through on WhatsApp, so we'll work through them. Uh, the first two that came through are directed at you, Mr. Lester. The first one here is, is there an imminent threat of the grid, the power grid, collapsing. And then one other, uh, you made mention in your presentation, Mr. Lester, uh, March 2024, when we desperately hope to see um, ESCOM stabilize the grid to some degree. Uh, could you just maybe give us more details as to why March 2024? And yeah, you, we can deal with those uh, first two questions and then we'll proceed after you've answered those. So thank you. Over to you, Mr. Lester. Well, thank you very much, Regan. So on the question around uh, grid collapse, imminent grid collapse, I know there's been lots of discussion and uh, lots of talk in, in, in both the media, social media, etc. around this. I, I do want to indicate that uh, there is a very good system in place at ESKIM. And, and the idea with that system is that they will continue to go into deeper stages of load shedding to prevent grid collapse. Uh, a total blackout would effectively put the country at risk for at least two to three weeks before we could do uh, before we could one island and then do a cold uh, restart on on the system. Uh, but the system is designed to get to uh, to to prevent uh, the the grid from getting to that point. What I do foresee though is if the energy availability does not improve uh, over the next few months, that we will continue to go into into deeper stages of load shedding. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, even at stage six, it's quite unbearable. Uh, but I think if it doesn't improve, uh, we should be reading ourselves for stages eight, et cetera, as the winter hits us. So now I don't see an imminent grid collapse. I do see further levels of load staging, uh, uh, load uh, shedding stages being implemented. On the question around uh, the reserve margin and what happens come March 2024. Uh, I think what I try to indicate is if I look at the energy availability, if I look at the outlook that ESKIM has for the next 52 weeks, and if you look at, uh, again, those last two columns that I showed, you will find that we only start to see relief in 2024 March, where the picture starts to go a little more orange from the initial red, and that really means that the reserve margin has been improved, the energy availability factors also improved to the extent that we can say we're now shifting out of load shedding or to much lower levels of load shedding, which is typically a stage one and two. And so, again, if I look at the picture, I see that by March next year, uh, if uh, all the maintenance activities go as per their plan, uh, there isn't any additional uh, major incidents at Eskim uh, that will start to see a bit more relief. And I'm not saying no load shedding, but lower levels of load shedding uh, come March uh, 2024. Thank you, Ligun. 
Thank you, Mr. Lester. Um, Premier, questions has come through directed towards um, you. Uh, the Westcap government is investigating 1.1 billion rand over the next few years in energy resilience and security measures. Uh, do you have an idea of the total investment if you take a look at what uh, individual municipalities are doing as well on their part? So uh, what is the total investment if you take uh, from what local government and the Western Cape government are putting into this. I know the minister did touch on this, but if you could maybe just elaborate on the total investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for the question. Perhaps also just to add, uh, we have previous Digicons on the grid collapse or, or uh, bl full countrywide blackout, uh, and obviously we continue working with those scenarios and updating them. And so uh, we've already held a Digicon on it, our cabinet engaged on it this week. And uh, we've also asked for even sort of more refined uh, one pages on how to deal with it. And we will come to the to the uh, citizens in the unlikely event that that ever happens, that there is a clear uh, idea of what will happen and how uh, we will get out of it. But we'll come back uh, in the not too distant future on that. So the, the uh, overall question about expenditure. So in our province, it's for the next three years and it's 1.1 billion Rand uh, towards uh, you know uh, the various projects that we got in, the pro in this province. Uh, I think what Helen and the minister have just uh, spoken about now at municipal level, um, if we, we spoke about those energy packs uh, for indigent households, it's about enabling the private sector uh, the announcement by the city of Cape Town is 2.3 billion and their program as well, as you've already seen, going out to private sector for investment, uh, but also mm -hmm. looking at uh, the, the energy champions, you can actually get paid back money for what you save because you're saving the overall system uh, right down to your own embedded generation, getting cash for it if you sell it back into the grid or perhaps, for example, the upgrading of the Stenbrost. Uh, Dam where they're going to look at putting in a second turbine uh, so we can get more sustainable uh, uh, hydro energy out of uh, the system. Um, and then, of course, all of the other municipalities, I think, which, which Helen spoke about. And in their expenditure, it's about uh, making sure that the grid, their own municipal grids are capable, uh, upgrading those grid systems, uh, making sure that they're uh, enabling the private sector to put power into those various systems, looking at how we can create um, a, a, a small microgrids between municipalities. And if I look at the, the number over the next three years that all of our municipalities and the province are spending, we are now getting closer to 7 billion rand over the next three years. So it's a lot of public money really being focused in making sure that we end load shedding for good and we create resilient systems that are going to give us the power that we need to grow the economy, create the jobs that we need. Uh, you know, the role that it plays in safety in uh, in our province is critical. So that's why it is such an urgent uh, urgency for us. That's why we're holding these Digicons, to keep people up to date. So thank you for that question. And there's a lot of money and a lot of people putting a lot of time into finding these solutions as quickly as we can, but also bearing in mind that it's not a quick fix. Uh, you know, as Alvi is saying, next March, and we know it takes 18 months to build, uh, you know, a, a solution. So this is something that is going to take time, but there's it, a lot of money being invested. Thank you, Premier. Another question has come through on social media, um, and it hasn't specified, uh, the person who's posing the question hasn't specified to whom it should go to, but perhaps um, Helen or uh, Mr. Lester, uh, and the minister, maybe you would uh, be able to uh, tackle this question. Will the lower cost effectiveness of biodiesel for generators be something that the Western Cape government uh, would consider? Thank you, Regan. Uh, so in our uh, proposed uh, Western Cape integrated diesels plan, I, I think I want to indicate that uh, you know, the technology type for us, we're not being specific around it, but a factor that will definitely relate to which technology we take at which point in that plan uh, will be the maturity of that technology. It will be the environmental impact. It will definitely be a cost factor. And it will also be the geography that will determine uh, what technology we can apply at what particular time. I can say in the sort of balanced mix that we look at, um, we are looking at things like waste to energy as an option as well, 
so we are considered of quite a few opportunities, uh, again, very much related to the timing, the costing, maturity, environmental impact. So it is being considered as well. Thank you, Regan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lester. Um, Helen, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, possibly just to add that our Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning is actively working on biofuels. Uh, so that's to understand the different options available uh, and understand the costing of those and how those might be coming down over time and who the players are in the market. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, two more questions have come through, and I think after we've done, uh, we've dealt with these two, we'll start uh, wrapping proceedings up. Uh, this next question directed to Minister Wenger. Um, could you uh, maybe give us more detail on how the growth for job strategy facilitates energy resilience? And then one other question, I suppose, uh, it's a general question which could go to the panel generally, uh, if I could just find it here. Um, could we provide more information on the support being offered to SMMEs and how uh, my business might be supported by the provincial government? So um, we'll start with you, Minister Wenger. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. Um, so, I mean, through our Growth for Jobs focus area, um, in particular energy resilience and transition to net, um, net zero carbon, we're trying to make sure that um, we have affordable, reliable, uh, for, and affordable and reliable electricity supply because our economy needs it. Um, and electricity really is um, what creates the enabling environment for businesses to be able to thrive. Um, and um, by transitioning from only fossil fuels to a mixed uh, energy energy sources, we'll be able to attract critical investment, which will also help support economic growth and job creation. Um, this also has the added advantage of leveraging this transition as a source of a competitive advantage for the Western Cape's economy. Um, and um, through these interventions, as well as the ones that Helen has gone through extensively, our growth for job strategy, in particular the energy pillar, contributes to uh, economic growth and job creation in our province. Thank you, uh, Minister. And just that, that other question on support that I suppose generally the Western Cape government could provide um, small businesses uh, and medium sized businesses. Um, I, I think one component would probably be the growth for job strategy, but uh, maybe you could just tackle that question as well. So we are uh, we have a budget allocation to support uh, SMMEs in particular in the informal economy, which we're working on at the moment, and we'll be hopefully be able to present at one of the future Digicons. But also to try and help um, businesses out there in making decisions about what kind of alternative alternative energy solutions they could implement for their particular business. Um, and depending on the size of the business and their energy needs. Um, and that will include developing a calculator, which will help businesses to understand how to leverage the tax incentives that have been made available and to be able to properly understand what uh, the costs involved are and, of course, how to, to access financing and tax incentives for um, energy resilient solutions. Thank you, Minister. I'll now hand over to the Premier for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Premier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I specifically thank uh, the Minister and Helen for, for being on this platform today. And I think through the presentation shows you the kind of work that is happening. And when you looked at, looked at some of the numbers on the slides, it really shows you the volume of work that is happening uh, from a, a small team, but a really dedicated team to enable uh, all municipalities across this province to help our businesses make decisions, uh, to enable them to become energy resilient and therefore competitive. But also it's for us as a whole region to make sure that we can mitigate this risk, uh, actually see the end of load shedding because that will just change uh, the capabilities of every uh, business and economy and investor and entrepreneur in the region. Uh, but then again, it also knocks onto the citizens 
uh, just about our daily lives. Uh, I, I always think of uh, those citizens who, again, are being impacted because they've got uh, learners in writing the trick or just at school, not able to study in the evenings. The startup businesses are really finding it hard to employ more people. We've got to get it right. Uh, and in doing so, also, how do we have a competitive energy pricing uh, and, and, a, and a sustainable system? And I think that's what's going to come out of this uh, crisis. Never waste a crisis. Uh, then can I say, obviously, to Alvi and, of course, the team that's behind the scenes on making sure that this Digicon hap happens every week. Thank you very much to you. Uh, and uh, most importantly, to the media and to the citizens for engaging uh, please keep sending those questions through because through those questions, we know how to tweak this platform, how to bring in new uh, information that is needed. And uh, as I finish, I'd like to also ask Alvi to perhaps come in with his uh, tip of the week. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Premier. So just uh, to give some uh, some response to a study that was done in the end of 2021 and what it did, it then looked at how do you rank countries across the world and there's about 195 countries in the world. How do you rank them in terms of their generation capacity for renewables? So out of the 195 countries, South Africa ranks 42nd uh, with about 7.8 gigawatts of renewables. Uh, the top five, it's China, the USA, it's Brazil, it's India and Germany. And they are making significantly more renewable energy available into their system. Now, I think why it's important for me to mention this fact, at the moment, South Africa leads uh, the continent in terms of renewable energy installation. Uh, but I think uh, very close to us and chipping on our heels are some of the North African countries that have come on board quite quickly with uh, renewable energy. So I think there is a bit of a race happening on the continent at the moment because, again, uh, with the commitments made at the COP uh, summits and also our commitments to a decarbonized economy, it does become quite critical for us to start making those shifts and trying to stay you know, ahead of the pack uh, in the continent. So 42nd at the moment, and I think uh, good chances if we continue with our programs in the country and in the province, that will improve that position significantly and we'll see a lot more renewable energy coming into the system. So 7.8 gigawatts uh, with ambitions for much more. Thank you very much, Regan. And with that, we've concluded yet another Premier's Energy Digicon. I thank you uh, to all those who joined us, specifically Minister Wanga and her team. And same time, same place next week for the 12th Energy Digicon. Have a good week. Thank you very much for joining us.